I can't tell you exactly what Galileo did, but I have a pretty good general idea from what I read. So, the specifics of the experiments that follow are hypothetical, but the results that we get will allow us to draw the same conclusions that Galileo drew. Now, Galileo had a general understanding of friction, so he built a ramp with a very smooth surface. He ran some experiments comparing the results for a rough flat surface versus a smooth flat surface. The ball picks up speed as it goes down the ramp. It slows down sooner on the rough surface. Those are qualitative statements. He wants to be more quantitative, but it's hard to measure acceleration and deceleration. So he sets up another ramp as shown here. Using inductive reasoning, he infers that if friction could be eliminated entirely, the ball would roll forever on a flat surface. This conclusion directly contradicted Aristotle's view that continuous horizontal motion requires a continual push or pull. In this way, Galileo was the first to state a clear formulation of inertia. Galileo proposes that for a ramp of any given slope, the acceleration is constant. That's not easy to prove, but Galileo is a clever fellow. The rest of the experiments are done on a smooth, flat surface. He says, let delta q equal the distance between two points. Well, he probably didn't really say that, but let's imagine he did. Q is commonly used in modern physics to express any arbitrary spatial coordinate. Here's delta Q1 for the first experiment. Here's delta Q2. Now let delta T equal the time between two events. Now let's create a table and take some hypothetical measurements with our water clock. The results that I am going to show you are pretty close to what you actually might get if we could eliminate friction entirely. Interesting side note, if we could eliminate friction entirely, the ball would not roll, it would slide. As we go forward, keep in mind that Galileo, according to the custom of the day, expressed mathematical relationships in very precise words rather than in algebraic equations. We will use the latter. Let v sub f equal the final velocity. We make the approximation that for short distances, the velocity is constant along this smooth surface. Then, by definition, v sub f equals delta q sub 2 divided by delta t sub 2, which here equals 7.1 meters per second. Let delta v equal the change in velocity during the time interval delta t sub 1. Since the initial velocity is 0, delta v equals 7.1 meters per second. Again, by definition, the average acceleration, A, equals delta V divided by delta T sub 1, or 2.5 meters per second per second. Now let's shorten delta Q1 to 5 meters and run the experiment again. Here are the results. Delta T sub 2 is 1 second, and so the final velocity is 5 meters per second. To get the average acceleration, we again divide V sub F by delta T sub 1. So, as you can see, we can confirm Galileo's conclusion that the acceleration for a given slope is constant. Let's ask another question. 
Can we find a relationship between delta Q1 and delta T sub 1? Let's look at the numbers we've already gotten. For example, let's consider whether delta Q sub 1 equals K, some constant, times delta T sub 1. That would mean that 10 equals K times 2.8 and 5 equals K times 2. If this were true, then we should be able to divide the first equation by the second in order to eliminate k, and then show that both sides are the same. We get 2 equals 1.4, which is clearly false, but Galileo, being the clever mathematician that he is, notices that 1.4 happens to be roughly the square root of 2. In other words, 2 equals 1.4 squared. Let's take that information and propose a new equation. Delta Q sub 1 equals K times delta T sub 1 squared. We can plug in the data from both experiments and get an estimate for K. Notice that k appears to be pretty darn close to one-half of the acceleration a. So we are very tempted to write a new formula. Delta q sub 1 equals one-half times a, the acceleration, times delta t sub 1 squared. Further experiments would show that this a formula is generally true for falling bodies. What if we ran the experiment with delta Q1 equal to 10 meters again, but we increased the initial height of the ball from 2.5 meters to twice that number, or 5 meters? Let's do it. We find that the acceleration is 10 divided by 2, or 5 meters per second per second. The acceleration has also doubled. By doubling the height, did we double the angle theta? Well, to be precise, that's not quite true. If, as we said, we hold delta Q sub 1 constant, doubling the height doubles the sine of theta. Now, for those of you taking physics, this relationship may at first be puzzling because when analyzing the forces operating on objects on an inclined plane, you would focus on the angle alpha shown here. I just need to remind you that the cosine of alpha equals the sine of theta.